Hi. Welcome to the new podcast. So we have a new guest on this this podcast today. His name is Justin. Justin, say what's up. Hey, how's it going? So this is uh, Justin is uh, filling in. Well, not filling in. Angel no longer works with us because Ben fired him. <laughs> oh, come on. Teasing, Listen, teasing. An, I, love Angel. <laughs> I loved Angel. I loved Angel. There, he lost two podcast episodes. Yeah, and had a couple. We had a couple of other technical issues, and it just wasn't working out. Mm -hmm. And he was very understanding. Actually, when I called him, I said, "Hey, it's not working out. We're going to replace you with someone else." He said, "I totally get it. I haven't been doing good work." Yeah, so it was. It was not. He was not caught off guard. Totally. And and all jokes aside, Ben. Uh, ben is much better at handling. <laughs> the, the hiring and firing of employees i, I always am. have to be bad cop <laughs> always and uh no and yeah zero hard feelings it's it's a bummer but no uh, i like him as a person yeah just needed someone who wouldn't lose three hours of footage yeah so you might have noticed that there was like a 10 day gap in between podcasts and that was because we shot one and then lost it which was yeah it was a really big bummer but Still anyways like him as a human yeah all good justin is here justin welcome thank you uh, all right, so what else do we have today? So Someone's going to miss this, by the way, miss this episode. Yeah. Tune in next week and go, Angel sounds totally different. <laughs> is Angel of a cold? What's going on? Angel, Angel is just completely transformed. Uh, so a video went up, and I wanted to – you didn't get a chance to watch the Paul Rudd, right? No. Well, I did a video I shot yesterday, and you guys will get a preview on respect. Respect. On respect in ways that people uh, really lose respect that's the angle but of course the flip side of that is how, how to, to get gain it back. respect yeah uh and it's interesting because we were we were brainstorming the list of things that get respect and we came up with several that are like dress nicely like you know, do all the things and i had to admit i am unwilling to do many of them <laughs> <laughs> and i think that it's interesting because as we've kind of grown and it's a good evolution there was much more of our behavior was catered towards earning generating and creating respect which mm -hmm. there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong from that but when it becomes uh, the total focus of one's interactions it, it it cuts into authenticity it makes you not behave in a way that's going to be pleasing for you well it's, you've had a huge change yeah. from 25 to 32 in terms of not caring what most people's judgment of you is mm -hmm. you know what i mean like you're comfortable meeting someone and walking away and them having a good impression a bad impression it doesn't seem to concern you it definitely still does but i'm trying to move away from it i think this is and i'm reading another book it's by byron katie she's uh very popular for her loving what is book mm. and what she asks you is whenever you're i'm reading this new one and it's kind of like radical honesty where it tells you stop trying to impress people stop being courteous stop being polite and i wanted to bring that up because there's this yeah i don't love that i know there's this well she doesn't say stop she says imagine what would happen if you did and of course your reaction to that is i don't like that yeah. at all perhaps for myself and for other people well, i have flashbacks to being 19 and being a sarcastic dick and yeah. people not liking being around me yes you know what i mean i have a lot more friends and stronger friendships and relationships now because i did work on changing my habits mm -hmm. well I, I suppose the question that she would ask is when you were being sarcastic, was that with pure self-interest in mind or were you trying to be liked even in that moment in a less effective way? I wasn't trying to be liked. It was a defense mechanism that I acquired because mm -hmm. I was very small and nerdy growing up. Mm -hmm. So I would cut other people down out of insecurity. So by mm -hmm. the time I hit 19, it was a habit. Got it. I was no longer you know, small or being bullied or whatever, but mm -hmm. I had seven years of doing it. Yeah. So it was an, it was unthinking. Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer, but I was re I was reading this book and it's very anti being courteous. And I just shot this video that was about the ways in which you can get respect, mm -hmm. which is in and of itself. It's, we've talked about manipulation in the value neutral sense, which yeah. is you're trying to get a result from a particular situation sure, in the same way that fashion makeup all these things are manipulation exactly and i and i i sense that the answer isn't wholly to either extreme yeah uh but i really value honesty <laughs> <laughs> which if i was to be completely honest all the time with everybody there would be no tact yeah i would just say mean rude things that would be completely unpersuasive alienate people yeah. in my life Especially uh, uncensored honesty. Like, yeah. Not just honest, but share unfiltered honesty. Mm -hmm. Every time you had a thought, like, that's a stupid comment. Yeah. Saying it, 
Yeah, it wouldn't, you wouldn't have a lot of friends. Sure, and I'd carry whatever previous upsetting interaction I had in the day into future ones, yeah. and I would just be rude all yeah, of a yeah. sudden. So there's this, uh, it's, it's funny, I was on both sides of the fence within 12 hours. On the one hand, I was thinking about the ways in which you can consciously command greater respect and the habits that you should do to not. Yeah, well, you know what's interesting? Just because it's in a book doesn't mean you should do it. And I'm not saying this mm -hmm. is a bad book, but even just the fact that she wrote a good book yeah. doesn't mean her second book is worth anything. Books really have to be judged on their own merit, taking what they teach and experimenting with it. Because mm -hmm. I can think of someone wrote two marketing books, one I quite liked, one that is clearly wrong because it uses examples that are outdated and were incorrect. Mm -hmm. And I can think of other people who have written books and I wouldn't want their life. You know what I mean? So it's really interesting because... I have been persuaded by the fact that something is a, not even a self-published, a published by a publishing company book, but that doesn't mean that it's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think her advice is great. I think perhaps I'm missing the nuance in it. And, and there is a synthesis of these two ideas that is, that works well together and is yeah, elegant yeah. and, uh, displays it. And she doesn't, to be clear, she doesn't say remove tact. What she says is to notice all the ways in which so many of your behaviors are influenced by a desire to cultivate uh, positive emotions about yourself. Well, I think what you would want to do is develop self-love, mm -hmm. develop self-esteem so that you can come from a place of internally generated joy. Mm -hmm. And then you can stop trying to please people because you won't be coming with bitterness, insecurity, sarcasm that's not based on self-amusement but based on cutting people down like yeah. those things come from having not done some inner work and carrying baggage from your past mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah so i think if you want to be completely unfiltered completely i guess natural it's i would suggest look at your current habits and see where they come from and if they come from past pain past insecurity something like that then you're not at the point yet where you're ready for that and you should instead work on self-love and self-esteem and self-confidence sure so you're saying you're not at the point whether you're ready to be to remove the tact part like yeah you, okay yeah you're not ready to think to stop thinking about other people's feelings politeness things like that because you're not coming from a confident place of love mm -hmm. you know what i mean if you're coming from an extremely confident place of i love myself and i love other people and by default i'm happy because i've done the internal work to get there, mm -hmm. then sure, maybe you don't have to worry about other people's interpretations of what you're doing. Yeah. But if you're just a person who's not worked on yourself for very long or has struggled with this because you had a rough childhood and you have trauma in you, then just coming into the world with your default habits from your childhood might not be the best thing for you to do because those habits were not formed from a good place. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're not comfortable with yourself yet. Well, I think, I think you agree with this because it, it, it if I'm misinterpreting you, it could sound like what you were saying is first get really solid self-love, then remove tax. But I think those two things necessarily go together. So it's like you build some self-love, you stop people pleasing in the most extreme scenarios of your life. Like you build a bit more self-love, which is aided by the fact that you're no longer people pleasing and you can ratchet it back without being a complete yeah. angry jerk to everyone in your life because you've got anger inside i just wouldn't go to zero yes. funny enough my life at some point was extremely improved mm -hmm. by thinking how is what i'm saying going to impact other people emotionally yes that was an incredible lesson for me yeah, yeah. and it made me not argue about stupid stuff because why are, you're bickering over something that doesn't matter and you're ostracizing your friend it made mm -hmm. me stop being sarcastic it was one of the best lessons of my life totally and i think it's a lot of there's a lot of unlearning to be done i think that up to say 25 or 30 for myself and many people it's all about strengthening your identity and your ego right so it's like uh deciding your personality really committing to it changing it exerting control and then you start reading these other books it's like okay that was a necessary set of training wheels to get you to the point where you're not just an angry yeah, infant yeah. screaming at everybody now we can ratchet it back try to people please less, uh, be a little bit more direct in your frustrations. Now that you're an adult and have the tools to cope with it and deal with it in a way that isn't just rage filled, useless yeah. screaming. Well, the, at the end of the day, it's just, do you like your results? Mm -hmm. If you find that you are completely uncensored and you never think about other people's feelings, 
but you're happy with even if you don't have a lot of them you're happy with your friendships you don't mind the reactions you're getting you like your life do your thing if you find that you would like more friends or you'd mm -hmm. like to make better first impressions or you'd like to have your dating relationships go better i would assess what what emotions are you creating yeah. in other people that you don't like right so other people don't find me attractive and go okay well what am i doing that might create that or might emphasize that or, mm -hmm. or strengthen that i make bad first impressions on friends and people don't want to see me a second time okay well if you don't like that then ask yourself what behavior is making them feel that way but if you don't mind mm -hmm. how your results then yeah do your thing and and interestingly enough if you're charting your results and, and they're rising, they actually rise to a point by really focusing in a degree on being people pleasing. That's what five, six, seven, eight year olds do. They learn how to cultivate a personality that pleases people around them. Yeah. But in order to increase that upward trajectory of positive connection, you have to do somewhat opposite behaviors, which is, is pull back on the people pleasing sure. at some point. Only if you want different results though. Let's say you went, let's yeah. say you read how to win friends and influence people. You join Charisma University. You're not doing any emotional mastery, mm -hmm. ayahuasca, meditation. You're just like, I don't focus on the self. And you get to where you just charted, right? Yeah. And you're saying, well, you can get somewhere else. I'm not even going to say, I don't yeah, want to make yeah, a yeah. judgment, but you, there's more growth to be had somewhere. Okay. But if you like where you're at, yeah, don't bother. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I think it's, it's really, it's just, are you happy with where you are? You know, you got into a lot of this different emotional mastery growth because you went through a breakup and you were unhappy mm -hmm. with your internal emotions. Mm -hmm. That's a great time to try to change behavior, you know what I mean? Or change mindsets. So yeah, I don't think everyone, ha you don't have to just try to grow forever sure. in my opinion. Sure. Sure. Uh, I totally agree. And, and oftentimes when people ask me, should I read this? Should I do this? Um, 20 years old should you know and and i see all of my friends are focused on achievement should i just skip that period and go to what you're talking about i'm like no yeah. <laughs> be 20 to achieve do all of those things yeah. there's it's it's not improper for people to be focused on opposite things at different points yeah. in their life depending or, on how the results are affecting them subjectively or if someone was like oh should i read the four-hour work week my question would be do you like your job mm -hmm. If the answer is no, then you should read it. If the answer is, yeah, I love my job. I love going to work every day. No, don't bother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it really does come down to, are you happy with your experience? Mm -hmm. And even just pulling back it, when you watch, if you watch the video on respect, recognize that I don't think that respect of other people is the end all be all. Uh, I think this is, this video is an effective tool towards an end, which uh, may or may not be appropriate for you at this point in your life and sure. it's interesting a lot of the charisma on command videos that i'm making today are perfect for someone at one stage and and not for someone at another yeah, yeah. and so it's it's just it's interesting to be reading one book that is is anti what i just said and then going okay how does this synthesize with yeah. what i did 12 hours ago well i think it's worth yeah i think it's worth noting not everyone has the same goals or wants to get the same place we have an employee that we've tried to promote Mm -hmm. and she just wants nothing to do with it. Yeah. She really, she keeps turning it down. And so someone, like we could make a video on how to get a promotion. Yeah. And someone could send it to her and say, oh, you should watch this. Yeah. But if you don't want a promotion because you're not comfortable managing people and you love your job as it is, then you shouldn't try to get a promotion. And mm -hmm. I think that that analogy can work in charisma and everything else as well. Yep. You know? Yeah, yeah. Goal, your goal determines the value of any given behavior exactly so to say that this is good or bad is completely silly outside of the reference point of the goal yeah exactly yeah. so if you should stop people pleasing or not if you if you are a dick like <laughs> i was yeah, yeah. and people don't like you for it you should focus more on other people's emotions and if you find that people think you're a people pleaser or you get called a nice guy and you get or a nice girl and you or get walked even all just over the internal because this is still focusing externally even just the internal sense sure. of worrying about what yeah people if you're tired if you feel anxious because yeah. you're constantly thinking about other people and then you should ratchet it back yeah, yeah. so goals are important people <laughs> yeah, yeah you need, it's a step step one i think at some point we talk about define your north star it's funny whenever people call in for questions or advice they asked me you know we had um, Mauricio who called in and said what should I do about my family they're they're a part of this religion that is very cult-like mm -hmm. and the answer is always what's your goal yeah. <laughs> you know like do, do you want to make sure your family's in your life at any cost well you're gonna get one piece of advice yeah, yeah. is the answer to flourish uninhibited well then you're gonna get a completely different piece of advice yeah we had another call in where the guy had a business a drone business that videotaped golf courses yeah and he said how do i grow this business and the question is is your goal to grow this business or is your goal to have a successful business yeah, yeah. what we never talked about is 
does this give value to golf courses? I have no idea. Yeah. But if it doesn't, just start a new business and forget the fact that you have a sunk cost of a drone. Yeah. Because your goal is just to have a business that you like. It's mm -hmm. not to have this business necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is one of the most important questions that it, within the, the business of Charisma on Command that I can ask as somebody who's like strategizing what we do, but also for people in their lives, what is my goal? Yeah. <laughs> because people get they get so wrapped up and if they're going to get the promotion yeah. next cycle. And it's like, have you stopped to think that you hate your boss yeah. and that you'd be working more closely with him if you got this? For, like, Maybe the goal should be to be happy, in which case you drop the promotion completely and move in a, yeah. to a new industry. And I something. say this with no judgment. I yeah. lost I lost it this year at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got so excited by how fast we were growing that I started putting my eye on how do we keep growing as yeah. quickly as we are. And at one point you pulled up and you were like, hey, is your goal to run the biggest business possible or is your goal to be happy? Because I noticed that you're doing a lot of work you don't like mm -hmm. to pursue a goal. And I was. I had lost my North Star. Yeah. You know, so it's important to pull up and go, why am I doing this? And is this really my goal? My goal is to be happy. Mm -hmm. So why am I doing things that don't make me happy to pursue the goal of business growth? Yeah. That's not my goal. Yeah. So I think it's, I, I say that just to say it's not that other people do that because they're dumb. Like I do it too. Everyone does it. Yeah, it's important. And that's one of the reasons that I, one of the things you know that I do is I go to these foot spas and I get these mm -hmm. hour long, yeah. <laughs> hour long like feet rubs. If you've ever been in one of these, they're often funny because they have, I don't, maybe it's true, reflexology. It's got all the different organs of your body on the sole of your foot and you like push one part. It's like liver. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like I do that for an hour. I don't notice any of that, but those are the moments where I create enough space to go. I've spent all day trying to achieve X and then I realize, X is not what I really want. <laughs> yeah. You know what I did too at one point that I see a lot of people do? We don't have to harp on this because mm -hmm. we talk about relationships a lot. But I see a lot of people who they start to become obsessed with the idea of making their relationship work. Yeah. And work means just last. Just continue. Quality is almost a secondary thing. And I think their goal is to be happy or to find a relationship. Not even to find a relationship. To be happy is their goal. And they get focused on trying to make a relationship work even though it's made them unhappy for the last six months and it continues to make them happy, unhappy day to day. Mm -hmm. That's when I see people commonly lose their North Star. And these aren't married people. These are people who have been in a relationship for nine months yeah. and the last three months haven't been happy. And it's like, yeah, you should just break up. You only had six good months, you've had three bad ones, unless there's an insane reason why. But it's very easy to get caught up in that goal of like making the relationship just continue yeah. instead of going, well, my goal is to be happy and I would like to date someone who makes me happy. I've seen myself and a lot of other people make that mistake. Totally, totally. That's why I love philosophy because it asks the question underneath the question, you know, and even it would question why is my goal to be happy? Why, you know, yeah. like all of that is to me where the real, the merit and value and of, of any given subject is. Yeah. But anything else on that before I hop into? No, it? not on that. The, this is kind of a, a repeat of something we talked about, but I think it's truly amazing. So Shane Dawson has had this beautiful world of Jeffree Star thing they launched the makeup palette that he had mm -hmm. it was the highest grossing makeup palette ever uh people are crying they feel you know yeah. part of a movement and i watched the most recent video which is i think it should be mandatory for anyone in marketing on the internet today because he's the best out there he's and and i don't mean this in any sort of negative value judgment this video is about an hour of testimonials <laughs> about makeup with inspirational music and i was like what is he selling because it's clearly not makeup mm -hmm. people don't love makeup this much but when you really dig into the feeling that you get it's and and the story that he tells what's what's being weaved in is that he's he's kind of an outcast you know what i mean he doesn't totally fit in and jeffree star doesn't totally fit in but there's this coming together over this makeup and people unbox it and are crying and they're part of it. And he shows all of these videos of people unboxing, which are essentially testimonials for everybody mm -hmm. who missed round one, right? And it's this community. It's be a part of something. By buying know? my makeup. Y yes, yes. But of course, all sales, I, I don't single him out. There's nobody who is saying, here is my widget. Here is what it does. Mm -hmm. Here, you know what I mean? And, and it is uh, well, a commodity that is undifferentiated from the rest. We could honestly benefit a lot by creating more of a sense of community. We're just not we, good at it. We do basically yeah. go, do you want to be more charismatic? <laughs> Buy this course and you'll be more charismatic. There's not a much sense of, and 
you'll be part of a community. That's one of the things I want to work on in 2020. Yes. So, or, well, also to ask yourself, is it true that you'll be part of a community? Well, I want to make, sorry, I don't want to change our marketing. I want to change, I want to make more of a community. Got it. And, and yeah, yeah, you can't. Just... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, I mean, I, I guess there's no community in the makeup, funny enough, though. Like, I'm thinking of putting students there in touch. Is, though, and... Because when somebody sees that you have that shade on, they know that you are like them. Can they really tell the difference? Uh, there's some shades that they were very adamant about, or several of the people that are bright green, you know, it, and they carry the purse and it's got, it's shaped like a pig, which is one of his mascots. And, but it comes with a purse. That's the big thing. Uh, well, you, you, either way, there are ways to signal that you're part of it. Mm. And it, you wear it on your face. And I'm sure people in the makeup community can tell in the same way that somebody with cauliflower ear might not be noticed by most people, oh, but fair. you would spot it. Fair. Like, you'd be like, oh. Don't mess with that guy. Yeah, that guy's a wrestler. Like, yeah. we could we could talk about that. And it's it's just fascinating. It's, it's what did I say? Any marketer needs to watch it. Uh, lots of storytellers. If we ever do a documentary, I feel like we have to watch this because it is some of the most persuasive media that has been put out in the last yeah. handful of years. It is funny because so many marketers are making video sales letters mm -hmm. and they're trying to figure out how do I get people to watch this? How do yeah. I force people or trick people into watching this? And is it going to be pulled down in one not, day? Not it's leave. not going to Yeah, yeah last. exactly. Yeah. This, this <laughs> webinar is live and yeah. it's not, and it's going to come down and it's not. And Shane just goes, here's an evergreen video. You can watch it whenever you want. It's an hour long. Yeah. And people watch the full hour and it's it's just marketing material it's crazy well it's not again to say it's just marketing material i think is especially from his perspective it's his life and his thing and it's connecting with him but it has the effect of selling 30 million dollars worth of makeup yeah. like there's no arguing about that uh, well let me put it i guess it's 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 centered on a product Whereas if you go to PewDiePie's meme review and you watch it for 20 minutes, I don't think it sells anything for 20 minutes, except maybe going to Reddit. Well, you know, it's interesting because PewDiePie sits in the PewDiePie chair. Yeah, and you can buy the PewDiePie chair and it's featured for the entirety of, of the video. But he know. doesn't mention it. Sure. Uh, yes, yes. But the, the interesting thing is there is a story that's going on and they're talking about the makeup, but it's it's almost, it's, it's like any good branding, which is strong emotions are generated and then tied to a, the purchase of a product, right? So yeah, like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not deriding them. I'm saying yeah, yeah. the smart thing is that they center it around the product, which mm -hmm. I think is different than if we sold a Charisma on Command mug and without ever mentioning it, I just held the mug and drank from it occasionally. Yeah. There's a difference when you, the, with this, you center the content around what you're selling. Logan Paul used to do this with his merchandise. Uh, Shane Dawson's doing it with his makeup. I think that's very different than having something and never mentioning it. Yeah. I'd love to talk to him because I think I don't I haven't formed an opinion. I'd love to talk to him about how he thinks about the ethics of it. Like, what do you feel like people are buying when they buy into this? Mm -hmm. Does it deliver? And the truth is they're buying part of a community and it does. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like, if you're crying from joy when you get <laughs> yeah, it, it, it I mean, you're, you're buying it, it to it make works. you feel good. Yeah. Makeup is designed to make you feel good, right? Yeah. You're crying from joy. It's yeah. delivering on that promise. Yeah, and if your friends are excited about it, it's like that's kind of the, that's the best point. you could have asked yeah. for. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, it's just it's really interesting. I'm considering having the people who we work with, like you guys, have to watch this to to see where the world YouTube is headed. Yeah, and not that we have to go in the same direction, but it's really really interesting. Uh, anything that you want to talk about? I have a handful of other I have stuff. one thing, but it's charisma related. I don't know if now's the time. All right. Well, I'll, I'll continue then. So you didn't watch the Game Changers documentary. Nope. I did. It was a documentary that Arnold Schwarzenegger was a producer on. It was featured in it. And it was a documentary that talked about the benefits of a vegan diet mm -hmm. from a, an MMA fighter who was injured, started looking into veganism and found that it was better in all of these What's ways. his name? I don't remember his name. I think he won the Ultimate Fighter, though. Okay. So he's 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 a good fighter, you know. And it goes into the Tennessee Titans and how fifteen of their guys are on a pure vegan diet and all these things and the, these athletes. And then I watched. I suspected at the time. I was like, this very clearly has an agenda because mm -hmm. it wasn't just focused on the health benefits. Some of the the research that they showed was rather weak boned in mm -hmm. the sense that they took three guys and gave them uh one got a vegan one got a thing one got a thing and they measured their blood 24 hours later it's like well this is persuasive but yeah. certainly not scientific yeah uh and there was there was a, quite a bit of 
anecdotal testimony, which I totally get. And then the end, the final 15 minutes is, oh, veganism is your health, but also it's terrible for the environment, like, or meat eating is terrible for the environment, it's terrible for this, it's not nice to the cows. It's like, okay, I see now what your true thrust is, which is you think that there is a problem with the meat eating industry, which I agree with. Mm. But you've masked this in being a personal benefit agnostic of ethics to the individual who Mm -hmm. chooses to go vegan. So Joe Rogan had a guy who, uh, a scientist who feels otherwise, thinks otherwise, has researched otherwise. And it was very interesting to hear him, in his own words, I haven't heard the debunk of the debunk, but debunk a lot of the claims that were made about... Is he talking specifically about the Game Changers documentary? Yes. So one thing that he says is they cite... Uh, as an anecdotal thing, the the vegan documentary kind of starts with, we found that the gladiators in ancient Roman times were vegan. Like, <laughs> these are athletes. These are this. And you go, oh, my God, is this good enough for this? Gladiators good enough for me. And he's going, and then he says, guys, this is silly. Gladiators were slaves. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> they were slaves, and they needed to be fat because if they got cut, they didn't want it to hit a nerve or a muscle or a bone. You know, these people had a lifespan of two years. This isn't what we should be modeling or even pointing to yeah, yeah. when we talk about the pinnacle of human health we also have no idea how athletic gladiators were like it's nice to romanticize them but they were in there to fight for the death sure. so they weren't necessarily the most elite warriors they were just the ones that their lives had no value in the society yeah and at the risk of repeating him you can check out the video for yourself if you're interested he talks about some of the deceptive but true things that were said so he says okay he says that all of the amino acid acids that are present in animal proteins are present in plant proteins which is true but they're just present in way fewer quantity like yeah. the amount of peanut butter that you need to eat to equivalent uh, to, to find the equivalent bioavailability of protein that you get from a steak is like two-thirds of a jar or something like three compared to three ounces of steak yeah it's tough to find a plant that has more protein than carbs or fats Mm -hmm. which means that in order for you to get the amount of protein a lot of calories you have to have a lot of carbs or fats yeah so it was it was interesting and unfortunate because if you've watched this before you know that where i fall is i definitely think that there's huge ethical problems with eating meat as it is currently created today yeah slaughterhouse meat yeah uh, but I wonder if sometimes these documentaries that get very overzealous and in an attempt to be persuasive don't just dis- disrupt the credibility of of people who might be persuasive in arguing for change completely. Because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I saw that documentary and it was debunked. That made no yeah. sense. That made no sense. And now I don't believe some of the other true claims that mm-hmm. one might make about the argument and it yeah i was just it was unfortunate (laughs) to just have him go through and sort of make common sense arguments that put a lot of what was said to shame yeah the other thing that i thought was interesting and and this is where i think the meat eater guy's argument kind of falls apart is he then brought up how it's can be worse from a moral and ethical perspective to eat just plants now there's a handful of reasons for this one he says more animals die from the industrialized eating of plants than they do from the industrialized eating of animals because you're tilling the soil you have rabbits are getting ground up uh you're being displaced huge tracts of land have to be taken and joe pressed him for sources and he didn't really have one and <laughs> okay like again here's what we have here we have somebody with an ideology over here somebody with an ideology over here yeah and uh you were strong with your one point and now this is completely yeah. <laughs> i'm finding this less and less credible so i found that not persuasive yeah. at all well it's funny we always we talk about this a lot the the best way to have a sound argument or sound thought opinion on something is don't come in with an ideology like don't come in trying to prove that meat eating is superior just come in and discuss where the documentary is factually incorrect mm-hmm. And, and unfortunately, he might have been 90% better, but when you when you introduce that one weak argument, it undermines the credibility of everything because yeah. we can't know and assess every everything. We're kind of using you as a proxy for honest, good faith attempts to find the truth. Yeah, and when you find someone has lied in one area, you have to go, well, I wonder where they lied mm-hmm. and I didn't catch them. And I don't mean to say this guy lied, to be clear. Uh, I just think it was a flimsy argument sure. it intended to bolster his perspective. But he did raise a really interesting point, and, and you brought it up, is that ethical concerns about where you get your food don't stop when you get when you go vegan 
you mentioned the almond thing, like how oh, Cal- yeah. California has been turned into a monocrop of almond farms that are just depleting the soil. Yeah, as soon as almond milk got <laughs> big, because people were like, dairy's bad, almond yeah, milk's yeah. good. It just destroyed a lot of yeah. uh, agriculture, apparently. And so he talks about this, and this, I don't know if his science is correct, but it passes the sniff test for me that uncritically moving to a plant-based diet is going to mean that the same cost-cutting industrial practices that created slaughterhouses are going to just be ported to getting your plant food for you. So it's going to be monocrop, destroy the soil. Uh, you know, if animals get ground up in the thing, who cares? Uh, and well, that's, that's not if, good either. Yeah, yeah. If your goal, if your goal is to only eat things that are sourced in a way that you feel comfortable with morally, mm-hmm. you'll do different research when you're buying stuff which will change the behavior of producers because mm-hmm. they will know that that work is being done. But if you're just going, oh, dairy is bad, yeah. I'm going to go non-dairy, then they all they have to worry about is making a non-dairy alternative. Yep. So that's why it's interesting when Game Changers claims it's for health benefits. Well, now the battlefield is health benefits. And if omnivore ends up being healthiest, then people should go omnivore because you've, mm-hmm. you've only said the reason to go vegan is for health reasons, mm-hmm. which is interesting because if you say that it's to spare the feelings of animal suffering or to do sustainability for the planet, then you can try to arrive at whatever is actually best, which yeah. might be vegan, might be omnivore, might be carnivore. Yeah. Yeah. And it, what it raised for me is that going with easy heuristics, like you said, no dairy, don't eat animals, just plants and stopping there uh, incentivizes and encourages uh, complete exploitation of with the exception of the one thing that you said that yeah. you're not going to exploit. And it's tough because people don't have the mental space to, to be concerned with where did their clothes come from? Where did their food come from? What's going on? Where, how was their car made? Like they've got yeah, most day to day trying to make stuff. a living. Exactly. They, they might not have enough money to pay rent at the end of the month. Yeah. And so it seems like the only way that these problems get adequately solved, technically you could have this benevolent government that is, that is making these decisions, but of course that's going to raise the cost yeah. <laughs> for everybody. So it seems like the only way around this is a simultaneous uh, raising of the standard of living for the average person, with ho- which hopefully technology takes us to. And Andrew Yang has talked about kicking back a thousand dollars so that people can perhaps be more concerned with global or even community level issues. Uh, but it's a raising in the standard of living, and also a raising in this in the sphere of concern of the average person, which isn't accomplished by simply going vegan Mm -hmm. and nor is it accomplished by simply saying ah veganism is bad i'm going to eat meat because it depletes the soil and and stopping your argument there so yeah man it's hard to uh to live in a way that is sustainable if it were multiplied out to seven or eight billion people yeah quite frankly we don't we never will come close to that the amount of air travel that we both do is you know we can't we couldn't possibly will the whole world did that uh and it's i don't know what to do about it (laughs) We live in we live in such a way that is uh, definitely not passing the Kantian categorical imperative of saying that you could simultaneously will that everyone else in the world did the same thing you did. So we're bad. Interesting. <laughs> you think so? Uh, well, it's it a, any average American. You cannot have that standard of living for the average American across the world. There need to be poor destitute people in order for some people to live like an American lives. And that's and we're not an average American. We are we are certainly in the upper class. Why do you need impoverished people in other countries in order to have a high quality okay, living so, in America? So let's just start with food. So in order to get the type of food that you have per person it takes X amount of areas, X amount of water, X amount of this, there isn't enough space, water, animals or people to do that work, right? So that's just for your food. Uh, take the amount Why of, do you think that? That there's not enough space so what seems to be agreed upon, and I, I could be wrong. Because I have no today, idea if the answer is just that other countries, and maybe the U.S. as well, don't use their land efficiently. I, I'm sure that it could be used more efficiently. But both the, at least this one meat eater guy and this one vegan guy, agree that the that there are unsustainable problems with both going feeding the whole world on a vegan diet. One of the problems that you mentioned is the amount of calories that has to be consumed to get enough nutrients is way higher, which means that you need more land. And the efficient way to do that is with a monocrop. But if you have a monocrop, you're going to destroy the soil within 20 years, you know? 
Uh, and so everybody's on soy and then everybody has these problems and half of California turns into an avocado <laughs> and all of those things happen. Meat eating, in order to get the amount of meat, you need tons of, of pastures, unless you have a slaughterhouse where you keep them in tiny little pens and, and you know, pump them full of growth hormone and then there's, you got enough space. But in order to ethically eat the type of food, the type of cows to get the clothing that you have, uh, it, there's not enough productivity in the world to, to allow that multiplied by 7 billion. Uh, and so, really? Even if there was just one person calling the shots, like it was a big game of Sims? If one person got to determine, if oh, that no, was their you, only goal? And So what we would do, just pretend that productivity is, is what it is at, and luckily it's going up. Yeah. You are above the average line for the most people in the world. You would have to reduce to the average for everybody to be able to live at that standard. I mean, that's what it means to be no, above only the average. If you, only if you thought all the resources were being allocated efficiently. People are trying. Seven billion people out there trying. No, it they're not. They're profit better. maximizing. Well, I mean, the argument is that that's the best way to, and I, I agree that it's not, uh, that it approximates the best way to allocate resources. Yeah, but I don't know that that's true, actually. We'll never know. But I'm, I, I question whether it's the fact that the earth can't produce it. Or the fact that myopic human goals, mostly for profit, mm -hmm. may, 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 uh, mean that you <laughs> do focus all on almonds instead of you're rotating your land because you have an agreement, a uh, dictatorly God-driven agreement with yeah. this land that they'll rotate their soil too. So instead of you're doing almonds because that makes the most yeah. money and this person's doing almonds because it makes the most money, it's like you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. I'm not sure the earth couldn't actually do it. How much, well, just here's an example. How much farming are you doing? <laughs> you know, like none. Like how much sewing of clothing are you doing? None. We sit here and we talk on podcasts, yeah. right? It's certainly less backbreaking than 99.9% .9 of jobs that have ever been done. For sure. Uh, if we were to average out and say, okay, I'm going to do some farming. But that you're saying all the, but that's if all the resources stayed the same. What I'm saying is maybe there's a more efficient way there definitely is. And that would mean that you wouldn't have the, – the current average might not be the optimal average. It definitely isn't. It definitely isn't because, of course, we're going to have higher levels of productivity in the future with the same planet. But given the current state of technology, what is – even – let's just say the only problems that were removed were the political ones, uh, the profit-driven ones. But we were still limited by technological Sure, but here's an example. All the, like if you were, if you were doing – efficient resource management you wouldn't need to put money into nukes or i'm not saying this sure, is sure, sure. plausible mm. given the world that we have yeah, yeah yeah but i'm just i'm questioning whether the earth can't sustain eight billion people i think it might be human created problems because you take all the money that goes to the military put it towards this take mm -hmm. all the land that goes towards whatever wasted non-efficient global uh food creation and you just change it yeah. you know you take no. you take the casinos <laughs> and you change them into something else you know what i mean Totally. I, I do. I don't know if it's an earth problem. It might just be a human decision making problem. Yes. No, the earth, I think many economists believe, you know, has a carrying capacity, which we have not yet reached. Uh, so, yes, that is that I think widely agreed upon to be the case that resources could be allocated much more efficiently. I'm still like, let's put it this way. Jeff Bezos can't be Jeff Bezos in that world even if we allocated it efficiently because you can't have a hundred billion dollars in this in this efficiently allocated world because everyone can't have a hundred billion dollars so the people at the very very top slice are going to have to take a hit in order to bring everybody else up sure but we might not have to <laughs> okay maybe we won't have to we can't know and this well, otherwise we're just arguing fake numbers we've gone deep into this topic yeah, yeah, yeah. though we could we could be arguing fake numbers we might want to put this at the back of the podcast nah, nah we got it uh did you want to have bring up whatever it has well mine was just because you actually mentioned did you watch paul rudd i said no i haven't so while you were talking to justin i just looked at some of the comments yeah i saw a question that i've gotten a lot and i've seen a lot in our videos which is we often recommend an appropriate level of friendly touch in uh -huh. order to establish trust and liking and a very common question isn't is that good or bad it's how do i do that that makes me very uncomfortable the touching stuff yeah so for most people, a lot of things make them uncomfortable, talking to strangers, yeah, yeah. eye contact, but they kind of get that they can willpower their way through eye contact, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. But the one I see a lot is just, I'm not comfortable touching people. I'm yeah. not comfortable doing the Will Smith and giving someone a hug. Yeah. So how do you get comfortable with touch? I mean, I can tell you how I did, which isn't helpful. I studied abroad in Latin America and I was the 
cold American in Latin America and was forced through social convention to do dos pesos, you know, like mm. every time I greeted someone or a hug and that became normal for me over the course of six months to 12 months. So when I came back to America, I mean, the first time I did, I started to do dos pesos and it was weird. And I scaled back Latin touchiness to a uh, higher than average American, but still well received. How so do I do it without leaving without the country? Without leaving the country. It's a great question. I mean, uh, I similar principles, I think, are in place. And you can also choose on people that are, are lower risk, like friends. Yeah, that was going to be my advice. So like male friends are totally fine. You know, you come up behind your friend at a chair. You, you grab them on both shoulders. You go, yo, man, what's up? Yep. Uh, you high five you know there there are there are really easy ways to to in a guaranteed non-offensive way yep. touch somebody the high yep. five being the easiest among them uh we played smash last night and as a joke everybody shook hands after their team won <laughs> in smash bros uh those types of things they can be jokes but yep. they they really do get you more comfortable with that stuff and then the levels which are you're not certain with which is can i touch someone on the shoulder can i give someone a hug uh, I think that you start to build a more accurate intuition of when it is and isn't appropriate. Mm -hmm. So if I'm walking into a boardroom and I'm dressed up, I'm not going to go hug every woman. You're in not going to go do those pesos to the, <laughs> You're the CEO. Not dose pesos. Oh, thanks for inviting me to your board. <laughs> oh, let's get to business. Uh, but yeah, certainly when people enter my home or whatever, you know, I, I give them a hug. When I meet, greet them for a lunch, even if it is if it's a casual business lunch, I'll still give them a hug. Yeah. Uh, and so those those sorts of intuitions have come from starting small and seeing what works. So you just you just said what my so I think starting with your friends or starting with people you're already comfortable with is a great piece of advice before going to strangers because that will help you calibrate. Mm -hmm. But you just mentioned what I was going to add, which is people will watch a video on Will Smith and will or Chris Hemsworth will say one of their strengths is that they touch. And then you show a clip and it's Will Smith coming out to a talk show. Hey, big hug. Yeah. You know, maybe he'll pick up the the host and they're like, well, I can't do that. And I don't know if this is something we haven't addressed or it's just being glazed over, but boil the frog, start small. So if you're uncomfortable touching anyone at all, start with a handshake. Don't start with, don't think you have to start with the Will Smith hug and pick up. And then when you get comfortable with that, go with the shoulder touch. When you're comfortable with that, give a quick hug. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something everyone can do a little bit more than they're currently doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And I think people sometimes see these breakdowns. And they go, oh, I could never tell a story like Kevin Hart. Yeah, I yeah. could never be as funny as Jack Black. I could never touch like Chris Emsworth. It's like, you don't have to. You just have to do like 3% more than you're currently doing. Mm -hmm. And then two days from now, do 3% more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I think that that's something that I don't know if we aren't saying it or people aren't realizing it, but that's how you Baby get step. comfortable with touch. Yeah. You don't just sprint to Will Smith. You take wherever you are and you go a little bit more. Yep. Yep. Baby steps. Mm-hmm. Baby steps. Anything else? No. Do we want to hop in? Justin, I know you had some topics. Ooh. Yeah. Um, Moment of truth. Big debut. <laughs> we haven't seen these yeah, yet. I'm nervous. Um, okay, so the first Everyone, one. Everyone, please let us know what you think of Justin. Be brutally honest <laughs> oh, in the comments. God. He'll be reading them. <laughs> okay, do so the first one comes from CBS, and it's on the topic of the phrase, OK Boomer, mm -hmm. which is hot right now. Um, and it's more of a thought piece talking about how OK Boomer may be considered age discrimination in the mm -hmm. workplace because places um, around the U.S., I think notably like New York, um, they have certain laws that protect people only over 40 <clears throat> um, against age discrimination. Like you can't call them like pops, like old fart, yeah, et cetera, yeah, yeah. et cetera. Um, in the workplace. In the workplace. Yeah. Yeah. Are people dropping OK Boomer in the workplace? <laughs> yeah. So then the the question the article asks is why is it OK or why is it not OK for, I guess, like young millennials to say this in the workplace, but say like older age people can make fun of millennials, say for like eating avocado toast and not being able to yeah. afford a mortgage. Yeah. 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 Well, in the, it's this seems like a conflated argument. It's totally OK to say OK Boomer in the same way it's OK to tease a millennial outside of the workplace. Yeah, yeah. Well, a workplace can establish whatever private rules it wants within no, the law. No, no. Within so the, the law, I, I don't know if this is a thing, but there's there's categories within the workplace that you, which, if you are found to be discriminated against, you are you are breaking a law. So certainly, uh, gender is one of them. Sexuality is one of them. I believe age is one of these categories, right. and it protects. 
I thought on both ends of the spectrum. That's what I'm saying. But I don't think a bo I don't think your boss can come in and just roast you for being a millennial every day. I don't know that they. I, I guess I've never seen it happen. But the common question and the and, and the refrain, maybe it's outside of the workplace, is people who are 30, 40 years old just talking about lazy millennials. And, but I'm saying outside. The, you can say that outside of the yeah, workplace. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't agree with it, but I respect your right to say it. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the thing. Is there's this workplace, non-workplace. I I don't imagine anyone in the workplace is walking up to their boss and their boss says, "Hey, I need you to do this," and they go, "Okay, boomer." <laughs> and I don't imagine that in the Someone workplace. Someone did. That's, that's a yeah, big yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, but. Like, yeah, you say whatever you want outside the office mm -hmm. and inside the office. Yeah, don't roast anyone that you're not close friends with. Well, it's also interesting. The the attempts and we've talked about this, the attempts to prevent discrimination uh, often seem so purely noble, but they run into problems when you get into the weeds. For instance, OK, no age discrimination must have five years experience. How is that not age discrimination? Mm -hmm. I'm 18. <laughs> How could I have five years experience? You told me it was illegal for me to work at 13. Mm -hmm. So I am being discriminated against because I'm 18. Uh, well, the flip side is true too, though. You could have an older, you can, I well, believe, come, fire an older person. For no. Not, yeah, for not being able to code. Oh, yeah, for, for not being sure. able to code. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. You change, if, when Netflix changed from a DVD delivery company to a streaming company, and they let go of anyone who couldn't code, I bet that meant a larger majority sure. of older employees. But that's not age discrimination. That's skill discrimination. Yes. But what I'm saying is those two can be, and you just gave an example, very closely linked. Sure. So it's t it is literally, if I'm 18, illegal for me to have five years experience. That is not something I could possibly have done because I, under the U.S. laws, I can't work as a child. Sure. When I'm 47 years old and I don't know how to code, I technically could now. Right, that was that was a path that was available to me, sure. uh, and so you do run into problems when you try not to discriminate based on age. Because the truth is, of course you discriminate based on age. Of course you want someone with well, yeah, experience. Yeah, you don't want an eighteen-year-old. <laughs> you don't want an eighteen-year-old uh, operations manager or chief operating officer. You want someone with fifteen yeah. years experience. Like, well, I can't have that because I'm eighteen. It's like, yeah, I don't want you being my COO. Yeah, I want you being my brilliant analyst. Exactly, and so. Uh, it was also weird. You know, we have age discrimination in the case of the presidency. You need to be 35 to be president. That is written into the U.S. law. Yeah. This was another thing that always was strange to me about Vegas, and maybe I'm not understanding the law. You know, you're not allowed to discriminate in the workplace. We just happen to hire all of the most yeah, beautiful yeah, yeah. women this to serve hilarious. these models. This one's hilarious. I really don't understand. I actually don't understand how it's legal. Models fall into a, a special category. Okay, because there are there's yeah. two jobs. There's busboy. Yes. That's all male. Yeah. That's much lower paid. You pick up cups. Yeah. And you bring the actual ice and you stuff like that. You come an hour early and then, you leave an hour late, Then by there's the, way. the bottle delivery person who's almost always a female. I literally can't think of a single male who did it, who gets paid much, much more. You have to be a woman. You have to be attractive, which mm -hmm. seems like two forms of discrimination. Yes. You cannot be unattractive or a male. Yes. And so it's... I don't... I've never understood why that one's allowed. I just think there needs to be a more honest conversation around discrimination while recognizing that everyone wants there to be some forms of discrimination around gender because not maybe everyone doesn't. Maybe there's someone out there that thinks that uh, these clubs should have to hire bottle men to come out and deliver bottles. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny though. That's not, that's not what the <laughs> consumer wants no. most of the time. Well, this is the issue is that consumers want to discriminate. Consumers don't want. Yeah. When you drop 10 grand on a bottle, most of the time you want the club to give you a certain person. Yeah. And, and of course I, I want to represent the other side of this. There was a time say in the fifties where consumers didn't want black people to serve them. And we want to overcome that. How yeah. do you how do you move forward a social change in consciousness? And it was kind of done through the legislature and the judiciary, right? We said, tough luck. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got it. You can't make them sit in the back. They are allowed to serve you. You're not allowed to discriminate based on uh, based on color at the water fountain, even if the majority of your consumers would like that to be the case. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not a clear cut issue in how you in how you handle discrimination. And uh, just every time I hear the word, it's it's I don't think it's given the due that it deserves in terms of how complex an issue that it really is. So, yeah, that I don't know about this. OK, Boomer thing. I literally haven't heard a real person say it. No, yeah, me neither. <laughs> Never heard it in real life. <laughs> I'm officially over the hill. TikTok to me is goofy. I'm well, I'm also a where I stand is, is, yeah, don't say what say whatever you want. I guess unless it's hate speech, if you're outside the office and inside mm -hmm. the office, obviously, you have to change what you would say. That's true of not just discrimination, though. 
Mm-hmm. You drop f bombs all the time with your buddies. That's totally fine. But if you're in the workplace and you're customer facing, probably your bosses are going to fire you if you just start dropping the f bomb all the time to clients. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you sorry, you have to censor yourself in private companies. Not if you're a chef, though. I was just watching some Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> Not if you're an excellent chef. Yeah. If well, you're a- <laughs> if you're a top guy, it's funny how that that industry just makes people scream for whatever i haven't done a ton of watching of those shows but i watched gordon ramsay on sean evans because we were looking into a breakdown and he just swears all the time Mm -hmm. and he talks about his mentors and he's like oh that guy (laughs) he was a real hard ass him (laughs) what do you mean uh something about that industry just makes people scream and go crazy i don't i don't know exactly what it is yeah interesting anything else we got so this is an article from the washington post just kind of on the advent of thanksgiving um, it's just like one of those kind of for fun articles about drinking bitters and how it kind of aids in digestion, how it's, um, it's apparently been a tradition in Europe for like a while, like Italians, French people, um, Germans, like the Jägermeister, mm. um, is like a super popular bitter. Uh, they'll drink it like pre-meal and post-meal is kind of like a, like a digestive because it's got its roots in, um, like herbal kind of medicine. Um, so I guess, yeah, I mean more just, do you guys have any... Well, this triggers, this triggers two funny things for me with Thanksgiving. Not funny, haha. You said Advent. That's what I latched onto. No, well, one, how do we still celebrate Thanksgiving? Yeah. When it's, I think, if I remember my childhood correctly, it's supposed to be the Native Americans and the British colonists coming together for a meal. Mm-hmm. How does this holiday still exist? It's weird that given Columbus the, Day catches so much flack. Given the complete genocide, it's people must just like it. It's kind of yeah. like how you don't replace, uh, you don't replace something until the technology overcomes it. You know, mm-hmm. like slavery was very much aided by the cotton gin being invented. Mm-hmm. People love Thanksgiving so much that they're just willing to overlook that we're kind of celebrating a genocide. Well, I don't know the specific story. Maybe somebody somewhere had a meal with some Indians in, in Even New England. if they did, though, doesn't yeah. it seem like a strange holiday? Well, the story, it's not necessarily strange. The story as it's told in elementary school seems unnecessary. Like, we don't have to say. Sure, that don't we make all, it about Native Americans. We all got together over a cornucopia and, and had this wonderful meal. Just say it's a day to give thanks. Sure. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. totally for that. You don't have to get rid of Thanksgiving. I. It seems really wrong to be celebrating anything re- revolving around the colonists and the Native Americans, There's a, given the massive death of Native Americans. Super interesting, and he's going to have a series. You don't watch CGP Grey, but I'll ask you, which do you think is the preferred term, Native American or Indian? I would have assumed Native American. And now you know that because I'm asking you. It's it's apparently he, this guy, he makes uh, fairly well-researched videos, so I, I give him this trust. Interviewing people? Interviewing people on reservations. Uh, no, it's 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 the, the culmination. He does animated videos about it. And so he says, when I went to these things, by and large, the preferred term was Indian. Now, mm-hmm. yes, it arose out of here. I mean, here's what the video is. You should definitely watch it. When we got to America, there were more peoples in America than <laughs> than anywhere. Right. Uh, they all called themselves different things. The title, which we foolishly slapped on them at the time, was Indian. As times passed, and of course many of them died from smallpox and were were given these broken treaties, which were over and over broken, pushed back further and further back into the the heartland of wherever they are, North Dakota, Montana right now, uh, they did culminate around this this identity of Indian, whether you were— uh, Iroquois or, or whatever you were, you would be like, okay, we, we need this shared identity. Yeah, yeah. And so they self-identify as Indians. And then— some white person somewhere was like, that's not right. They're not Indian. What they are is Native American. And they start calling, you know, 99% of the people say, oh, we've decided they're Native American. And he goes to the reservations like, no, call me Indian. Like, I'm an Indian. Uh, I don't want to be a Native American. Huh. And it's just another example of like, you know, it's just very interesting when you're trying to be PC without – consulting consulting the, the yeah. individual who who it, it is about that is fascinating uh, and of course this is just his experience but i do ex- give him the benefit of the doubt here because he, he tends to do very well researched videos and this is actually he called it part zero of a larger series on the Indi- on the american indian uh and so he's just like just to be clear this is why i'm going to call them indian for the duration american of this series indian. that's what you call them so the problem he they said that they had with native americans is that they felt it was too inclusive because 
Indian is the word that is usually used for continental United States groups of first people. But Native American can refer to anyone from Greenland, Canada, the U.S., Central America, all the way down to the tip of Argentina, right? If they were there prior to 1500, sure. they're a Native American. But you wouldn't just call them Indian. You would call them American Indian. He calls them Indians, I think. I think in this particular thing. They prefer, or at least the people that he spoke to, preferred Indian or American Indian, he calls them. It's just it's very that is interesting. interesting. I'll, try, I'll work on that. Not that it's wrong, but here's the thing. Who is going to correct you on that? Some white person is going to tell you that you're being... But then I'll tell them. <laughs> and I'll show them. I'll tell them. Watch your documentary, <laughs> sir. I have a friend that's 120th Native American. Yeah, he yeah. prefers to be called American yeah, Indian. Yeah, but the thing is, I don't... And I haven't spoken to anyone personally on a yeah. reservation, so I don't know. That's funny. The video... I'm not saying it is. I'm sure the video is, <clears throat> we'll assume, fantastic. Yeah. But you could also just find a minority of people that feel that way. Yeah. Only videotape them. Ignore everyone that wants to be called Native American and be like, see? Nine cases. Yeah. That's all of the people. Yes. Like, what? And I think it exposes the core issue with PC culture, which is, it doesn't intent matter more than, mm -hmm. than, and of course, if somebody asks you to use a particular thing and you continue to ignore it, like if somebody decided to call you John over and yeah, over yeah. and over again, you know, you'd be like, please call me Ben. Yeah. <laughs> that is what it's my name. Uh, you can, you can adjust, but yeah, in an attempt to, uh, be hyper inclusive and you can just get it wrong yeah. and it seems like that doesn't make you a bad person it's just focus more on the intent and the person-to-person -person connection rather than the erroneous use of any particular word when it wasn't meant derisively sure uh anyway what else we got well wait that's my one thanksgiving thought my other thanksgiving thought is how hilarious are humans when we are trying to figure out hacks that allow us to be more gluttonous like the answer is clearly just eat to your stomach's capacity or even 10% less than your stomach's capacity yeah. and then stop. But there's regularly human experiences. We used to go to this all you can eat steakhouse when I was in college once a month. And one of our buddies was in pre-med and he went, I learned that if you alternate salty and sweet, you can eat more. You're st you can trick your body into eating more. So we would alternate between the bananas and the steak. Stop eating when your body gets full. <laughs> you know what I mean? And this is the same thing. It's just funny. Oh, let's drink bitters so that we can hack our body and yeah. eating more turkey and stuffing. Yeah. How gluttonous can we be? Just, just eat until you're full and then stop. Well, I think part of the issue is that we now have refrigeration. And uh, there's a period of – large period of human history is like, we got this kill. We got to eat it. <laughs> you know, it's going to sure. spoil. It's going to go rotten. So but there was this – Not in 2019. Yeah, certainly not. Certainly not. Why were you eating so much? Were you guys trying to put on muscle or something, or was it just a cool no? It was thing just to a do? it was just a masculinity thing. It was just an eating contest. Yeah. Because well, and it was also you're in college, and so it's all you can eat, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not flush with cash, and you opt for this at the time fancy dinner where you're spending more than you would at Chipotle. Mm -hmm. So there's this weird sense of I'm going to get my money's worth, and my money's worth is defined not as as much as an enjoyable amount, mm -hmm. but as much as humanly possible yeah yeah right so you just got a bunch of 19 year old meatheads trying to get their money's worth and that's what happened <laughs> having one bad meal to avoid the next two <laughs> what and else? to be fair it was great yeah it was great i used to remember, yeah fuck with a show man that's uh, what it was i remember back in the day uh, next up okay so this next one's about um a boston college student that pleads not guilty to her boyfriend's suicide case um, <clears throat> so there's a student named In Young Yu. She's a former Korean Boston College student who actually was charged with uh, manslaughter because she had sent a bunch of abusive texts to her boyfriend, basically just threatening to either kill herself if he leaves, and then eventually that that kind of spiraled into um, like her convincing him to kill himself mm. before the day before or the day of commencement so he ended up jumping off the roof of a parking garage wow do you um, have the texts no like so they didn't that. they didn't release them they just said that there were over forty-seven thousand total in the last two months before he died Forty-seven thousand. Yeah. hold on can i do the math on that that's a texty couple right there over how many days over 60 days the past two months yes yeah, so around 60 okay so hold on that's a clock that's not a calculator so okay, boomer. Forty-seven thousand divided by sixty days is nearly eight hundred texts a day. Wow. Divided by let's say sixteen hours of being awake, 
That's 50 texts an hour. That's a text a well, minute. Well, that's for both of them, though, I think. So divide by two, right? No, 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 no. Forth. Okay. Well, you're texting every yeah, yeah. minute. If it could have been one and of those. And some of them are like, yes, what if, Yeah, no, what if they're one that... of those people that just doesn't like to put different thoughts? Okay. So, so, it's... so let's say that you did, yeah. Okay. What's going on with you? Good. Are you done? This... Yeah. Sounds good. Have you killed yourself yet? <laughs> that could be six texts. Sure. That means you get to wait six minutes before you have to catch back up. Yeah. That's, that is a lot of phone time. That is a lot. I actually, so on this topic, I do think there is a case to be made against someone for encouraging suicide. I do think that people with mental health issues can be pushed over the brink by someone with bad intent. Yeah. But this seems like it would 1,000% be dependent on reading those 47,000 texts. So I don't feel like I can have an opinion at all. Of course not. Well, this is a leap, but it for whatever reason, it made me think of Suicide Forest. Uh, and it made me think of the Logan Paul thing, how... I didn't see online a single person that was interested in understanding what drove that person to kill themselves. Right. I saw only kill Logan Paul. Yeah. <laughs> you should kill yourself, Logan Paul. You are scum. And I saw nobody addressing what even happened to that guy. What happened Why to this did he kill person? Himself? I mean, not that we need to go on a witch hunt, but like, was there someone in his life that did this to him? Or mm. was there a systemic issue that is occurring in Japanese culture or his particular culture? Well, there is, obviously, because they have a suicide forest. Because it's happening. So. And what can we do to prevent that? And uh, if I ever speak to Logan Paul, I would love to talk to him about this particular topic because there seemed in that particular situation to be no interest in addressing a problem mm -hmm. and just a, a, an outpouring of hate for someone who represented an image of someone whom it is appropriate and who you hate sure well i won't comment at all on suicide forest but what i will say is that hate existed before that video oh yeah logan it was paul for an outlet exactly logan paul people had a pent-up hate mm -hmm. and they vented it where they could yeah but what suicide forest gave them was a a feeling of a moral high ground where they could release the hatred they had already developed for Logan Paul yeah. for any number of other reasons. Yeah. But I don't think the most, I know people who had no opinion of Logan Paul and they saw the suicide forest thing and it ranged from, I don't think it was that bad to that was pretty messed up. He shouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. But I know no one who had never heard of Logan Paul or didn't have an opinion of him who heard of suicide forest in a vacuum and went scum of the earth should be taken off YouTube forever. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was that reaction seemed to come from people who already felt that the preceding way. Preceding year, yeah. And this gave them the chance to claim that feeling as righteous. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, I don't want to go. I guess why not? This is our podcast. There was the second thing that brought him down. That occurred, and obviously, it goes without saying. Yeah, don't film dead people. Not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. But if I remember correctly, in the same week, Kevin Hart was exposed for cheating on his wife, and you know, there were all these other things that nobody cared about. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the thing that Logan, so Logan did that, but he wasn't canceled at that moment. He continued making videos. Mm -hmm. And then what got him canceled was after that, he showed he didn't learn his lesson because he tased a dead rat, right? No, well, really it was this, the forest was the big thing. People have forgotten the rat, but the rat thing was, that yeah. was the, no, but that's what got him off YouTube. That was what demonetized him. He wasn't off of YouTube. Maybe that's what demonetized yeah, yeah. him. I, I don't remember the, it would be. We should go through the events, but what it seemed to me was occurring at that time was, uh, yeah, there was, there was, you said it, man. It was, it was feelings that he had generated, uh, deservedly or not, prior to these two events that finally had an acceptable uh, outlet yeah. for it. And then the rat thing, you know, he's tasing a dead rat, which is uh, where I get that it's gross. I get that you don't want kids watching it. Who was harmed? You know, like, like what. What problem was solved? Do you people not have rat traps in your house? Well, that was my point. <laughs> that was kind of my point. It's like, like now we're now I feel like we're grasping. Yes, yes, and it was again the the uh, indignation about that particular one with the rats, and we've talked about this one. Have you ever used a rat trap? Like he tasted a dead rat. Yeah. <laughs> Gross. But if he killed a rat, I would argue that that is morally worse <laughs> than than doing something with a carcass. Second, the entire meat eating industry. Let's not get into it. Yeah, every yeah you single could episode. A, you could be eating a hamburger, <laughs> watching Logan Paul yeah, yeah, yeah. rat going, "You're scum." Yes. Nom, 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 nom. What do you think happened to that cow? Uh, and that whole thing, and I would, and I don't know that he could even get away with telling his honest thoughts on no, it. No, no, no. Nope. He did the best thing you could do. Just, I'm a monster. Just bounce for a while and yeah, then I'm apologize. A, I'm a monster. Uh, and I'd like to talk to him about that. 
one day when the podcast is larger <laughs> or go on hit. we took a hard tangent but yeah about this girl it really just depends on what she said in her text sure and then the the other thing that i that we we always try to do this is like what's the systemic thing that's going on here is this a simple case of one person who was so crazy that they could convince someone else to kill themselves or you know what else was going on in this person's life that that created this not to let her off the hook but to try to prevent things like this because now this is the second which is only two that i've heard of somebody texting someone into killing themselves well my my this is a tangent as well my sister had an ex who did this she broke up with him and he's like if you don't take me back i'll kill myself mm -hmm. so she came to me because i was her older brother and she's like i don't know what to do this is incredibly devastating because i obviously care about this person a lot and to me weirdly enough that's once that happens you can never take the person back mm. because that, like that's just the ultimate deal breaker and so you put this child this teen i think she was 15 or 16 at the time in this terrible position where the only thing she can do is potentially cause someone to kill himself now obviously mm. she's not the cause right i yeah. think a healthy emotionally healthy person wouldn't kill themselves over a breakup i think that other things had happened in that kid's life yeah but it's just sucked for her and i was like listen you can never date this person because they will have you hostage forever. Mm -hmm. They'll just threaten self-harm whenever they want to do anything for you. So he actually, weirdly enough, in my opinion, made it impossible for you to take him back by saying this, whereas previously you could have. Yeah. But she's, a, I mean, these are, they're 19 year olds. She's yeah. 15. You know, she's a kid at the time. And yeah, it's like, I don't know how we got to the point where you have to deal with that level of, uh, emotional difficulty at such a young age but yeah i think i think this is a thing that happens all the time because my sister doesn't come from a remarkably troubled area yeah you know and i don't know anything about this kid but it's like yeah there's just there's just rampant not i don't want to say rampant there's people being put in terribly weird situations like this and that's what this reminds me of it's just like yeah that's a hard call to make at 15 yeah and he didn't do it thankfully but uh, yeah not that this particular story warrants a deep dive but it is, i am curious at this point as to what was said how it was said how it switched from i'm going to kill myself to you need to kill yourself <laughs> like what what leaps were made there i guess there were forty-seven thousand texts yeah. in order to tie those two together but you know, and the question would be how do you create a system that can uh inoculate people from being able to be manipulated like that i well I, we've talked about this in the past but i do think that young people oh, i feel like need a compassionate reality check because i feel like sometimes they're laughed at for being in puppy love and they're they're mm -hmm. derided for being in puppy love without the recognition of how strong that strong can be wrong it is when you know as an older person that oh this isn't gonna last yeah, this yeah. isn't real but to them it's the strongest emotional connection they've felt in their lives yeah based on what they have to compare it to mm -hmm. and so yeah and i feel like that compassionate reality check in popular media is missing either it's depicted as truly the worst event that has ever happened when you break up with your boyfriend in whatever high school drama that you're watching uh or it's just completely dismissed as like ah oh, two young people being stupid yeah. you know and and i don't know how many examples these people have of like look this hurts like hell i get it but also like welcome to the human race mm -hmm. everybody has to deal with these really painful things and i know it's really tough but you're going to look back on this in a year and you're going to think, oh my God, I can't believe that I was so upset yeah. over that particular thing. Well, it's interesting. We often talk about how people are influenced by the media they consume. It's mm -hmm. a form of hypnosis, basically. You just get inundated and incepted by what you watch on TV and what you listen to. What you just said, I realized when you are watching, especially high school related or college related love stories, and there's a breakup, the solution is often another relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think of like, there's that Freddie Prince Jr. movie or whatever it might yeah, be. There's she's the all that. Yeah, no, that might be a man. I know the one you're talking about. But there's there's <laughs> a thing where you and the person that you, the protagonist, and the person that you're dating break up, and it's devastating for you. And your hero's journey is often that you realize you were better than them or too mm -hmm. good for them, and you end up in another relationship. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching that and you're 15 or 19 or whatever, you are kind of being told that the relationship is the end-all, be-all. Mm -hmm. You have to get the right one. But if you lose the right one, now you're screwed because the only solution to getting out of a relationship is another better one. Yeah. That's kind of what we're 
sub communicated or straight up told mm -hmm. when we're teenagers. Yeah, and what if this girl was the exactly? What one? if this exactly? What, that's if, my what point. if what if you already lost the pretty blonde and she was the mousy girl with glasses that became beautiful and now you lost her? That's exactly <laughs> my point. <laughs> now you're really messed up. Yeah, if you don't think you can do better, then you can't be the hero of the movies you watched growing up because that's almost always the plot. And there's there's examples that aren't that right. Um, mm -hmm. Tangled, I think it is, the red-haired Disney princess that shoots arrows. It's about family. Brave. Brave, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, i never seen Tangled. That's the Rapunzel one. <laughs> I like Brave. Tangled. I never like seen Tangled. It. Not knocking it, never yeah. seen it. But those are few and far between and have only existed recently. Mm -hmm. But yeah, most of the time, the hero's journey is that you end up thinking you can do better. So yeah. if you have a breakup and you don't think you can do better, you've been told this is the worst thing that can happen to you. You know what I mean? Do you think that's good advice? Because, I mean, in a breakup, one thing that you can be certain is that the guy's friends are going to be like, dude, you're so much better than that. And that you go to her house and her friends are like, you could do so much better than him. Mm -hmm. Is that is that a useful myth? To Because we want it can't both be true. Is that a useful thing to tell someone in a breakup? Or is it, do you want to give them the more honest truth, which is like, nobody's better than anybody. You guys, you could just be happier than than you were with them you don't need to beat them you don't need to get a hotter well, I think boyfriend that, or girlfriend rather than better i think the the better way to phrase that is it's not that she's not good for you or he's not good yeah, for yeah. you like there's no you don't have to be superior right it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be that you're the catch and she was you were settling because you were blinded or stupid mm -hmm. but it can just be the sense of listen you're both people i'm not going to bother evaluating whose worth is higher mm -hmm. but this wasn't good yeah, and yeah. i do think that in most cases what you can say that's honest and might help the person is like you can find someone that you're better with mm -hmm. that makes you happier who you make happier like this thing that broke up is clearly not yeah. necessarily the end all be all and so forget who's better or worse but i think you can do better for yourself in terms of a match for yourself i, I actually think that subtle difference now when you're in the throngs of a breakup nothing is going to yeah, snap you right <laughs> out of it but a lot of the responses that people will tell you is man she like he wasn't that smart or that this or that that and you and that falls on deaf ears because like yeah but i didn't care about exactly those well like, you either I, don't care or you disagree yeah. so or you, you disagree. i was dating someone you're like yeah. oh she's not that funny she's not mm -hmm. that smart you you're just perceiving her wrong mm -hmm. it's like well that's not persuasive because exactly. to me she's quite smart and quite funny so mm -hmm. when you say that i'm just like no nah, dude you're not getting it you're not seeing her as opposed to you can find someone that on average you have a better emotional experience with without any sort of judgment of if, if she was smart, funny, exactly. uh, like you cannot fight like you were fighting these last several months. You exactly. cannot cry like you were crying. Or these if last you thought, I think a tough breakup is if you thought they were perfect and they blindside you, let's say. Yeah. And then it's like, well, you can find someone who you don't fight with. It's like, I didn't think we were fighting. <laughs> I thought it was perfect. It's like, listen, you can find someone who wants to be with you. Yeah. You know what I mean? As much as you might idolize this person, one of the core things that makes a relationship truly great is the mutual desire to be together. And mm -hmm. you might think that what you had was perfect, but I think when you find someone who wants to be with you as badly as you want to be with them, you'll see that it's actually a much better, happier, healthy relationship. So you, yeah, I think there's always a way to comfort the person. And I think you can do it by focusing on the relationship. And I think you can do it without disparaging the other person. Mm -hmm. I think it's a that's an important mentality that I've adapted adopted over the last few years, even in the dating phase where you're meeting someone, because it's very easy when you see someone and you're attracted to them, you don't know them very well, you talk to them and you get rejected mm -hmm. to think, oh, that would have been so good, that person, you know, if only I had them. And that was my thought process for many years. Mm -hmm. And recently it's it's perfect that that happened because they don't want to hang out with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that oh, whatever I thought, it, it was disrupted by the fact that they don't want to spend time with me and people who don't want to spend time with me are really tough for me to enjoy hanging out with. Sure. Uh, it was just hard. It was There was always the sense of their value was set, fixed in stone, and mine was relative to how they perceived, they perceived me yeah. and if I was accepted or rejected. And funny enough, we talk about this all the time, but there's phases for you to take feedback. There's yeah, phases yeah, yeah. where you have a crush on multiple people and none of them like you romantically for you to go, Maybe I should change my behavior and the way I present myself because perhaps I'm not doing myself justice, mm -hmm. you know? And then at the same time, it is good to find people that you match with who you can get along with. And it's not good to just pine for people who don't like you, who you wouldn't get along with. But there is, there's a time for both and you have to figure out how to marry the two. Yeah. Because there can be a world where you're smart, funny, interesting, and just terrible at presenting yourself mm -hmm. in the first 30 minutes. And so people who would like you 
aren't getting to see you. That's actually, that was the number one mindset that helped me in dating was when I realized that that person's not rejecting me. Mm -hmm. They're rejecting the impression of me that I've given. So if I walk up to someone at a party or a bar, we've never met, we talk for 20 minutes, they're not interested. That used to devastate me when I was a teenager, right? And then what I, what I figured out when I was like maybe, I forget it was 19 or 21 or something, is that that person doesn't know me. They're not rejecting me. They, they only know this perception of me that I created mm -hmm. with them. I guess we co-created based on 20 minutes of interaction. So they're not rejecting me. They're just rejecting what just happened in those 20 minutes. Yeah. That was a really helpful mindset for me. And one that, that I adopted later, which is like, this person is not the judge of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we, we, we put this, this strange power in these people and these- Because we're attracted they, to Did them. they reject me, didn't they? It's like, who cares if they did? Like, yeah. This is just a person with, you know, all sorts of flaws, foibles, and wonderful things, I'm sure, but- Sure. Like, and so, yeah, what I would say, tying back into what we said before, is if people don't like their dating lives or they don't like the results they're getting when they approach people of the opposite sex, I think don't don't view it as an evaluation of yourself, but do think, is there a way I can improve this 20 minutes? Because that is what they're judging because yeah. they don't know me. And that's where you get into charisma and changing your habits and better eye contact, better storytelling, all that jazz. So totes, totes. By the way, do you want to read for Charisma University today? I would love to. Do it. Knock it out of the to. park. Our sponsor from this ben. podcast is charisma <laughs> university our life's work our magnum opus if you like our youtube videos i guarantee you will love charisma university it is a 60 day program no 30 day 30 program, day program. It's a 30 day program day 60 day money back guarantee it's a 30 day program and i think the biggest benefit of it is it tells you exactly what to do every day to become charismatic so we've highlighted what we think are the most important things about becoming charismatic amazing first impressions unshakable confidence and we give you videos each day to consume and then an action guide so you know exactly what to do to actually change your life. Because I think a lot of people, I'm, I'm sure I'm guilty of this too, they try to learn things by just watching them, but then they don't go out and implement any change. Yeah. So they become very knowledgeable in something that they're not actually getting life results from. Mm -hmm. So Charisma University guarantees you those life results or else you get your money back. Yeah, and you can check it out in the description below or at charismaoncommand.com slash university. If you're listening, if you're on, listening on the many podcast apps that we often <laughs> yeah, forget yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so, we're so used to YouTube. <laughs> well, I actually think more people listen to it on audio only apps than correct. watch the videos. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else we got for questions? Patrick Reeves. He says, given your knowledge of human psychology, what values, virtues, and principles would you instill in a child were you to raise one? <laughs> I have put zero thought into <laughs> this. So I feel very unqualified to answer. I'm willing to go off the cuff, but I thought a little bit about it. I actually bought a course on conscious parenting from Mind Valley. Why? Uh, because I I wanted it one, but I think the I I kind of knew that the content of the course was going to be about you, the parent, and not about necessarily this is how you raise your child, uh, based on this particular individual. I forget her name. Um, but she even says so. She has a handful of myths about parenting, and she says parenting is about the child. Yeah. It's like, no, parenting is about you getting out of the way. And, and she's got very radical stance compared yeah. to, especially when contrasted with modern day helicopter parenting, yeah. which is like, she talks to Vision, who is the Mind Valley guy. And he's very proudly at one moment telling her like, yeah, like my, when we get home, like we'll read three, three parts of the encyclopedia. And it's like our time together. It's like daddy time. It's like so good. She's like, does he like the encyclopedia? He's like, I, I don't know. We like, we like, you know, he spends it with me. It's like, sounds like this is for you to create a, the kid that you think you need to create, which of course, no kid. It's like, daddy, daddy, like rather than this picture book, could we please dive into the encyclopedia today? Well, unless you make it fun. Well, you wasn't can... it Elon's kids where he totally homeschooled them and they'll just randomly be like, I want to take apart a car. Absolutely. He goes, okay, sure. We'll buy a car and, and we'll take it apart with hammers and wrenches. And so the question that she asks him is, have you set up a reward structure in his life whereby the way that he knows he can get your attention and love is by expressing interest in these things, yeah. right? Or is this, is your love unconditional and this is a genuine interest of his? And upon reflection, he says, no, like I 
totally rewarded this. You know, we have to, and he says, now we play video games because mm-hmm. he wants to play video games. And I think there's clearly, you can't go completely hands off because these little creatures will kill themselves yeah, if yeah. left to their own devices. Kids really want to kill themselves. <laughs> so A lot of kids really want to die. <laughs> we watched last night's uh, dad reflexes on Reddit. Yeah, it's which incredible. Is, <laughs> these kids are just jumping off of cliffs and yeah. like trying to just bang heads against anything that they can find. Yeah. But uh, I did find it a very interesting thing because I think part of what my initial unchecked impulse would be to is to do everything that I did but better, Same. right? And I and I would try to instill the value of honesty and I suppose care for other people, which is does not come natural, uh, and. You know, I'd have a guitar in the house and I'd have books in the house and those things would, of course, come through. But I would try to to keep the list of things that I instilled as small as possible and Mm -hmm. really reflect, like, is this a good thing? Like, does my kid need to have the same political belief and like really know my political belief? Of course not. I I can only think of three things, which is uh, honesty, self-love and the golden rule. Mm hmm. That's that's what I would aim for. And mm-hmm. I, I reserve the right to think much more thoughtfully about sure. this. And now if I did have if, if I found out that the person I was seeing was pregnant, I would consume a lot of parenting because uh, yeah. books and videos, because that's how I learn. That's yeah. that's how I've mastered anything. Yeah. So I'm very uneducated and I would not I would be very educated by the time the child was born. But off the top of my head, I feel like, yeah, honesty, uh, like you said, treating other people well, which I would say is just the golden rule, just empathy. So I guess honesty, empathy, and self-love. Those Mm -hmm. seem like the three I would aim for. Yeah. And the other thing that she says is like, the best thing that you, and Gabor Mate says this, the best gift you can give a child is your own happiness. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because what children learn, you can can try to instill values, but they're they're learning before they can speak and Mm -hmm. understand language. And they're learning your emotional states. And so were you know if somebody got pregnant i would I'd go on a crash course i would try really really hard to be like okay all the growth that i was supposed to do over the next 20 years yeah, yeah. let's try to get as much as we can in the next nine or ten months mm-hmm. because i think that's going to have a big impact but take all of this this is just yeah yeah this is hypothetical yeah. jibber jabber like ben and i have no idea what we're talking about so definitely don't make any adjustments i was gonna <laughs> ask when, you, what we when you bought a parenting course do you think you had a little uh, whoopsie daisy a little, uh, oh. No, no, not no? at all. I I enjoyed her speech. Uh, she gave a TED talk or something. She talked to Vision from Mind Valley about uh, conscious parenting. She talked about things that some of which resonated with which I already believe, and some of them pushed it. And that's exactly the t- type of stuff that I try finding. Just seeing if you got two months into your nine month sprint <laughs> and then found out you weren't a dad. No. If not I at ever all. found out, I would just do a crash course in these six books and this two, <laughs> these two courses, hypothetically. Hypothetically speaking. No, no, no scares anytime recently. It's been a long time. When I was 24, there was a scare. Was there really? 20, I don't know this. Yeah, 24, 25. You thought you had a pregnant lady. It was not that. It was like 10 or 12 days. But she was, she was, you could like set a clock normally with her by, by when she did. And random was, person or someone you're dating? It was Jesse. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so not random. For Dang. Those of you who don't know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a girlfriend. At the yeah. Time. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was mildly scary and then yeah. not after a handful of days know what i've never had i've never even had as close to a scare yeah yeah what else big condom fan um <laughs> love him okay uh so this is from <laughs> justin <laughs> welcome to the show justin we talk about a lot of weird stuff um then the last one i have is from jessica tran and she says how do you deal with a friend that you care about that seems to have a victim mentality um in this situation it feels like sometimes she wallows in her sadness instead of trying to look for solutions to her problems and being around her is emotionally draining. Mm. I would like to sit down and talk with her about this at some point. What would be your advice? I have some, but do you want to? I mean, to some degree, you can only change people that want to change. Of course. So does she want to get out of her victim mentality or is this something she uses for connection? And, you know, is this is this a problem that she doesn't identify? Because if it's the latter, I actually think that unsolicited advice often goes pretty poorly. Yeah. So you can decide how much you want, time you want to spend with this person, given that they're not enjoyable for you to be around. But I don't know. I would go in with questions. I guess let's say that. I would go in with, I would ask them, 
I'd get a really good sense for where they were at in terms of do they feel like they're being a victim? Do they feel actually victimized? Do they want to get out of their funk? Are they enjoying wallowing on some subconscious level? Do they have the same assessment of the situation that you do? Yeah. Which is that they are wallowing. Yeah. Maybe they don't even think so. And that would that would really determine my behavior completely, which mm -hmm. could range anywhere from trying to give them as much help as possible to lovingly telling them that I'm here for them if they need me, but I'm burned out from always being there. And so I'm not down for talking about the same exact yeah. thing every single day unless action is going to be taken. But I am down to hang out and I am down to be a shoulder when it's needed. Mm -hmm. You know, it would really depend on my information gathering. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, yeah, two part conversation, which is very similar to what you said. The first part is non judgmental, non persuasive understanding. And perhaps prior to this, I should say, you need to create a space for this, which is say, hey, we've talked about this. You know, there's something I've been wanting to talk to you about. Like, is now a good time? I feel like it could be a longer conversation. You open it up and you, you set a special. Uh, this conversation should feel different than regular conversations. Mm -hmm. Like people should be in a heightened state of awareness when and, this happens. And have a few seconds to Sit get there. in that mind yeah. space. You know, you don't want to blindside someone. If you're like, and it, by the way, this this is a little heavy. If you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to right now. But like, sure. I, you know, we can talk about it when you're done with that project or like later today or whatever. So you create the space. The first part is understanding. And it's, I would say, you know, compare and contrast your worlds be like here's what i'm seeing but i don't know if this is what you're seeing that you seem this is this the case is it not and everything about your tone and your mindset should communicate that you are trying to fact gather to understand her perspective of what is happening uh in her life and then like ben said there ought to be a second part of the conversation of varying lengths depending on what she says if she expresses complete disagreement with your state of the world this is going to be a shorter conversation, at which point you say, well, so here's the thing. At this point, I'm going to venture outside of my uh, my zone of influence right now and just like tell you what I am recommend unsolicited. And I know that's not a good thing to do, but here I am doing it anyway. Uh, I think it would be better for you if you adjusted these behaviors. And that can be very, very short part of the conversation if she's not receptive in the first piece to... Uh, any sort of shared understanding of what was happening. If she expresses in that first piece, she's like, yeah, I know, I see it, I don't know what to do, then this becomes a longer part, which is all of the things that Ben said. Do we, do we, uh, I can't continue to be here all the time, Here's, here is my availability, but in that section, you want to be honest about where you are feeling right now, honest about where you're willing to be in different uh, scenarios of her behavior. And I think that that's going to require you to sit down prior to this conversation and really think, okay, if this behavior continues, how much more uh, commiserating do I have left in me? Mm -hmm. If this behavior tapers off, how much more do I have in me? And, you know, you, I think it's totally appropriate that friends get more understanding, leeway, and uh, an ability to dig into a debt than a stranger does. But it shouldn't be infinite. That's not what friendship is about, is infinite tolerance for behavior. It can mean uh, almost a never-ending receptivity to restarting the friendship, but like you may need to take a break from one another while this person uh, figures it out, depending on how you feel when you check in on your own internal availability to be the shoulder, the the listener, whatever, and then communicate to her in that part of the conversation. Did anyone do it particularly well when you were going through your breakup? Because I know you had a a long period where you were quite upset, right? And so I imagine that there were, you had a various friends who were burned out from mm -hmm. hearing about the breakup because at first everyone's there for you and they have advice and they have a shoulder for you but then after a while i assume different people had different reactions can you think of anyone that had a particularly good way of handling this I'm trying to think what were the various ways i, mean, I don't remember it was a while ago it was, yeah it was yeah many years ago at this i mean point. so you kind of told me similar to what you said you're like hey i'm kind of tired of this <laughs> at some point and you listened for a while prior to that and i don't think that there was definitely wasn't bad um i got the message and what i did at that point was be more cautious in what i shared with you and that wasn't wrong <laughs> you know what i mean there was nothing that like you he doesn't want to hear about uh the emotion of the day yeah. like well it's kind it, of the same conversation yeah, yeah, for, yeah. Um, for months and so I, I think what i was hoping to communicate and maybe i didn't do perfectly like no no when there's up when there's an update like i'm here and when you want to take action i'm here mm-hmm 
um, but I've burned out of the of the just the sharing yeah, yeah, yeah. of the pain. Um, or or the predictable cycles. Even it was like, oh, sure. yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, today was good. Yesterday was bad. You know, like like, and she called and she didn't call. You know, I mean, like I've heard this story ten times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was a good. It was a fun one. If it's it a good the same breakup. story that I've heard, I don't want to hear. You know the update of her calling again is not actually an update. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, and I think that was appropriate. And, and you know, it, it forced me to, did I like it in the moment? I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. What I would have loved to hear is, hey. I'm here every let's day. Let's talk only about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, don't even ask about me. Who cares? Like, <laughs> that's what I would have loved to have heard. Yeah. But it was appropriate, I think, for the scenario. So yeah, she might not like this, but that doesn't mean that it's not the right decision for both of you yeah. uh, in the long run. No one stands out as like, oh, they handled it excellently. No, I'm, handled, not, I'm not fishing. I'm no, just no, no one handled it terribly. I don't think. Um, honestly, the worst thing that you can do is to is to secretly harbor resentment yeah. and and allow it to build past a point where this person, because they're so sad, doesn't even see that they're causing it. Like at least give them the opportunity to avoid digging deeper into the resentment. Um, and so. You know, our friend, and he was, he was on the podcast, Benji, like, I think just got so upset. And we lived in different cities for a while after that. He's just like, I can't f***ing handle this, these guys complaining about their ex-girlfriends anymore. Uh, and not that that was wrong. It was completely his well, choice. Actually, for me, it was just, I can't stand your girlfriend because <laughs> yeah, I was still with her. You were an exes at that point. <laughs> he was, yeah, I'm tired of hearing about your ex, and I don't want to be in the same yeah, country yeah. as your current girlfriend. So the little backstory is we all lived together in Brazil, and, and uh, Benji and another friend of ours were still very good friends were like tired of the like ben said his current girlfriend and my, my being regularly upset about my ex and so we took a year or so where we were in different cities couldn't get further away yeah, yeah. california <laughs> and the philippines <laughs> and the philippines uh and that we had not done that for a while yeah. and i actually think a a better solution would have been to have more candid conversations earlier so that i didn't have to or not that I didn't have to, that I would have had more options when it came to, am I going to alienate us to this degree, you know, or can I like yeah, yeah. lock some of it down, deal with it myself? And maybe that doesn't have to happen for that period of time. Especially what I would say, if you find yourself saying things behind this person's back, I would encourage you to as lovingly as possible, get them on the same page. Mm -hmm. I think one of the worst things that you can have is a relationship, friendship or dating where one party has an inaccurate sense of how the other party is feeling about their relationship. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously don't micromanage that. You know, if you if you go off by degrees, you don't have to have constant relationship talks because that's exhausting as well. But yeah, my thing that I would suggest is get on the same page so that you both can have honest conversations so that you don't develop an unspoken separation. Yeah. Yeah, that would be the only thing. And again, I have no ill will towards Benji because like I would have probably done the same thing. It's tough to sit down and, and say how frustrating someone's regular behavior is, has made you feel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we got lucky. It all worked out. Everybody's yeah. still super close. It's all good. All good. But good luck. That's it. Is that the end of the episode? Yeah. That's the cast. Well done, bang, sir. Bang. First podcast. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Hope that you guys enjoyed this podcast, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Yeah, let us know if you like Justin. Oh, sorry. Last thing. Sorry. We, I'm we're, just kidding. I'm we're just, we're not likes. here on this week or maybe next. It's going to be some time before we're back. Yeah, yeah. Thanksgiving. Only one week off. Uh, we're not here on Monday, so we might take. it might be a week a little bit more. Yeah, one week off. So this today's Monday. We'll skip Thursday and Monday, but we'll be back the following Thursday. So that's 10 days. Mm -hmm. Cool. See you in 10 days.